First of all, let me apologise for the lateness of this video. I've had a busy four or five days, so I'm playing catch up right now. I will hopefully have the rest of these videos out by the weekend. So in the meantime, we shall continue. So we're now on to our first commitment ceremony. This is where the couples get to say whether they want to stay or leave. The first couple on the couch are Shanita and Jordan. What can I really say about these two? These two are a match made in heaven. As Jordan said, it's been smooth sailing with them. They also answered Charlene's question by saying they have been intimate. And Jordan said to Zoe last night that he could see himself falling in love with her and then having her forever. I really have nothing more to say on these two. They're loved up. If any hiccups come along, we'll talk about them. But for now, we'll leave these two alone. So they both said they're going to stay. So the next couple on the couch were Jess and PJ. These two are very separate, as we all know. They may be very good friends, but I just can't see where this is going to go. But anyway. So the conversation started with them talking about they had a lovely honeymoon, the Maldives, everything was very romantic, etc, etc. But then Mel asked them about opening up. Did you have a chance to open up? PJ says he slacks in that department. He doesn't know what's holding him back. Oh, believe me, I know what's holding you back. Jess is holding you back. Because I know we saw a sensitive side to you when you were there. But from the time she turned around and said that something's missing, she doesn't know what's missing, you just shut down. Now you're trying to work out how do I get back to pouring my heart out. Because she ain't going to let you do it. The minute you show any type of vulnerability, she doesn't really want to know. She really doesn't want to know. But then Mel's saying that he needs to open up. No, Mel, I disagree with you on this one. He does open up. It's her that shuts him down. In his words, she's everything that he asked for, but everything that she asked for, she didn't get. That's what he said. Right now, he said he feels like a lost sheep. He wants to fall in love. That's what he came here for. He wants to fall in love. But whether she'll fall in love with him, oh, I, I, I really can't see it. He doesn't tick all her boxes. I remember Mel asking Jess, do you think PJ is good enough for you? And Jess repeated the question. Oh, do I think PJ is good enough for me? Yeah. Yes, he is. When someone repeats a question to themselves, there's a hesitation. Because they're trying to find the right answer to give. So that tells me she was unsure about how to answer that question. For her to repeat it again to herself before answering it. Jess also mentioned that she didn't want to lead him on by touching on him and hugging on him and all that type of stuff. Because it's going to send off the wrong signals. But then we heard Paul say this. Jess, I haven't seen any physical support at all. No rub on the shoulder, no hug. There's been nothing. Zero affection. Zero. As she says, they're good friends. We're friends. Don't we normally give each other a hug, pat each other on the back, give each other a kiss on the cheek? You get where I'm going. Not once has she shown any type of affection. And she calls that a friendship. You know what? I don't want to hear any more crap. I don't want to hear any more of the crap. And with Paul saying all of that to her, she got on the, on the defensive. And I'll show you what she said next. Well, if the cap fits. Once she'd calmed down, Paul asked Jess whether she could see herself falling in love with PJ. Her answer was, 
I don't know. We can try. We both came here for the same thing. We can only try. That's virtually what she said. They are both here for the right reasons, but are they meant to be? So with that being said, they both said stay. The next couple on the couch were Jenna and Zoe. With these two, they got on very well. The only thing, like, like Jenna says, is more about the way I live my life. Not everybody can meet my expectations. That's virtually what she was saying. But um, it's not all about someone's diet, how we get along. The food aspect can be a problem if pushed. And then it was the PDAs, because Zoe doesn't like public displays of affection. But she is affectionate, just indoors, or in the right environment, is what she said. So they have to work around that one. Because Jenna, I'm presuming, is more affectionate all-rounder. She's an all-rounder. So they're going to have to work on that. And then Jenna mentioned about Zoe being very thoughtful. She's never met anybody as thoughtful as Zoe in past relationships. That's what she said. So that was a good sign. And, oh, and we already know they've done the deed as well. So that was another question that was asked of them. So with that being said, they both said stay. The next couple on the couch were Keisha and Kwame. So they were asked how their honeymoon went. No, they were asked actually how the wedding went. Were they attracted to each other when they first met? Keisha said she was attracted to his beard and his confidence. And then when it came to Kwame, he said, she's a little different to what I would normally go for. But she had curves, a beautiful, she's a beautiful woman, and she had a beautiful smile. So there was something there. And then they were asked how the honeymoon went. And Keisha turned around and said, well, the first night he said he was taking it slow. And then by the last night, he said he gets bored really quickly. This guy, this guy, he's a waste of time, a waste man. I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, hang on, you applied for the show knowing that you were getting married to a stranger and you're not even making any effort whatsoever. So why are you here? Why are you here? I can see she's making an effort even though you're not her type. But you? Oh, please. As Keisha says, she doesn't want to waste her time. You're wasting her time. Another thing that questions me about his commitments. Did he not say he was in a relationship for 15 years and then married for six? Why did it take him so long? To get married. Hmm. Hmm. But didn't he say he got married at 22 or 21? The maths is not mathing. I, I, mm, none of this is making any sense. Anyway, let me play you what he said. I'm not so And the verbal diarrhea continues. Typically, this is what I would go for. So before I get to certain levels, I want to really get to know you better. He talks a lot of shit to try and confuse you. He's that guy. He just comes across as a playboy to me. I've just got no time for him. I, I really haven't. I'm just going to go straight to, to their decision. They both decided to stay. But I don't know why. I don't know why but they both decided to stay. Moving on, the next couple on the couch were April and George. Again, the conversation stemmed around the hot tub situation, but I'm not even going to talk about that. I'm tired of the conversation. I don't want to keep rehashing this one. I said what I needed to say in my last video. In conclusion, what they needed to do was to work out each other's boundaries. And on top of that, George needs to learn how to deal with situations when they happen rather than running away from them. So with that being said, they both said they'll stay. Moving on, 
The next couple on the couch were Lara and Richie. So these two had a lovely wedding. Both families seemed to get on very well, like they knew each other from way back when. The honeymoon, again, lovely time on the honeymoon, as far as Richie was concerned. But little did he know that Lara had something to say. But before we get on to Lara, when they were sitting on the couch, did you see Richie all over her? He's still not able to read her cues, her body language. This guy has a lot to learn. She doesn't want you to keep touching her the way you keep touching her. And with him doing all of that, she feels obligated to accommodate. Not that she wants to. She just doesn't want to hurt his feelings. That's what that was all about. Anyway, back to Lara. When she was on the couch talking, she went through the wedding, the honeymoon, and she started picking out the faults of Richie. This is part of what she said. As you can see, Richie was blindsided. He did not see that coming. And then she continues to say. I don't think he's used to having to think of himself as a two. He's always used to being one. I think what surprised me is that Lara's waited till tonight to say hi. She was definitely in the wrong here. She told everybody else around the dinner party what was going on. But she didn't tell him. The one person she should have approached first. She continues to say that she was really looking for somebody that's been around the block a few times, just like she has. Has the same type of scars. Somebody, somebody that she can relate to. Someone that has been there, done that and worn the t-shirt. That's really what she was saying. Again, I do feel sorry for Richie. I do. But I also understand where she's coming from. She's a big grown-ass woman, just like myself, with kids, just like myself. We don't want to be teaching you, at your big-ass age, how to be. From what I heard, I believe he's lived at home all his life. He's only spent three weeks away from home, living by himself, and even that was torture. He's been mummy cuddled, daddy cuddled, all his life. He knows no better. He's, li he's been living a solo life with his music for God knows how long. He knows no better. He's never been in a relationship. He's never had any kids. He's never been married. He knows no better. But then you want Lara to pick up behind you, teach you. And as she says, she called you a project because it is a project. This is like nurturing a child. Your own babies. He might as well be her third child. And then he wants to get married and get into, the, into a relationship thinking that it's going to be, what, straightforward? There's a lot of learning to do. You start that, what, in your teens? In your 20s? But you're 51 now. And you expect to learn that overnight and be the husband she wants you to be? That makes no sense to me. And as he said, he's learnt more in the last week, I'm sure that's what he said, than he has in the past 20 years. Are you hearing this? In the last week, he's learnt more than he has in the past 20 years. What has he been doing? Who, who's been teaching him? Who's to blame here? We did, however, hear Richie speak. I'm always fearful. Even after all of that, he still has hope. He still continued praising her for what she had done so far for him. How much he's learnt. Looking at her as his guardian angel, you might as well say. I I'm, I'm a little doubtful on this one. I, I really am. This is a lot of pressure for Lara to take on. People talk about change and not wanting to change. And this is me, I'm not going to change. But I don't believe that. Sometimes you have 
have to change if you want something special. And I tell you what, that's what I'm going to be doing. He definitely has a way with words. Because whilst everybody got emotional, I got emotional too, hearing all of that. I don't know what more to say. I'm hoping it's a straight road, but I can't see it being the case. There's going to be a lot of twists and turns on this one. Ah, oh dear. But I have my fingers crossed because he wants to learn. But whether Lara's going to have the patience to teach him, uh, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, in conclusion, they both said stay. Moving on, our next couple on the couch were Thomas and Adrian. These two touched on their wedding day and they described it as overwhelming. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. And then when it came on to Mel asking about Thomas being an exhibitionist, let's say, Adrian's response to that was, it was a lot. It was a lot. But it's only now that I'm getting to know him. I can see past that. I can see through that and what's going on behind the scenes rather than what he puts out to the world. That's virtually what he said. And when it came to Thomas speaking, he said he can be hard work. He's not going to change, he says. But I can adjust. That's the way he said it. I can adjust. Can he? Mm. Yeah, I'm very doubtful. Thomas goes on to say that he wants more from Adrian. He hasn't come on married at first sight to be friends at first sight. That's what he said. And then Adrian turned around and said he's looking for he's looking more from him. He needs to be able to trust him before anything more can happen. That's how he said it. But he did go on to say this. I think we need to get to this place where there is trust in each other builds. And I think for me that's the biggest thing. I, I think I'm a person who starts someone off with a 10. And he continues to say. But then, if your behaviour wants to knock those numbers down, then it does. You can build them back up, but you'll start with a 10. Solid 2. <laughs> anyway. In conclusion, they both said stay. So we're now on to our last and final couple, Whitney and Duca. Ah, oh dear. Where, where do I begin with these two? This was a hot mess. It was a hot mess. She's on the couch looking crazy. As I said before, if she presented herself correctly and said what she needed to say, without all this eye rolling and everything else that go and the bad attitude that comes with it, people would believe her. But with this eye rolling and, and, the, and the bad behaviour, it just comes off, you look crazy. And then we have Duca. All the things that she was saying about Duca behind closed doors, I'm thinking, is that what he said? I partly believe her. Because at the same time, looking at your behaviour... I can understand how he would react the way he reacts behind closed doors. So what is it that we're not seeing? You're not spelling it out enough for me. You came into this relationship with a bad attitude in the first place. Like I said, the minute you walked down the aisle, you had the worst attitude ever. And you expected him to be nice? And keep being nice? I know Duca, outside of here, would not have tolerated that shit. I know he wouldn't. No man would. So there's more to this story than meets the eye. And when Duca was speaking, well, when he got a little bit heated, we started to see the real Duca. That's what I expected. That's exactly what I expected. Because outside of here, that would have gone left. He would not have been as nice as he has been through this whole rigmarole. And just to get it straight, I'm not saying that he's a bad person. Not in the slightest. She brings the bad out of him. It's just the same way 
Thomas brings the bad out of Adrian. When Thomas gets on a high, Adrian has to match him. That's what happens there. And that's what I see in this relationship. But it doesn't happen in our face. It all happens behind closed doors. Anyway, enough of my ranting. The first clip I'm going to play you is just behind her saying that when she saw Luca for the first time, she thought, oh, he's not a bad looking guy. And then she continues to say this. Um, he's a stranger, there was no feeling. It was just like, this is a bit weird. Where you put this thing on your finger, you're like shackled to each other. Like, you know, like, you're in a room with someone. Just in regards to her using the word shackled, it brings me back to slavery. And I'm not here for it. This girl should know better. She's an absolute embarrassment. And as you saw, everybody else was in shock. You know what? I've, I've got nothing more to say on this one. Let's continue. Paul then asked what the problem was. Starting with Duca, he turned around and said, Whitney's walls are too high. It's hard to break them down. And then when it came to Whitney, she starts by pulling the ugly faces the attitude, the whole nine yards. I can't take it. And then she goes on to describe Duca very much. He thinks about everything before he does it. And Duca turned around and said, I'm, I'm very aware I want to set a, uh, he wants to set a good impression. So he's very aware of the cameras and he's trying to be this person in front of the camera and not just be naturally himself. That's really what she was saying. And that's where she talks about him being fake. It took her how many episodes for us to get to this point? Oh dear. All this faffing. And Paul goes on to say. I think when you have had relationships in the past that have not ended well. And therefore you are masterful at sabotaging relationships. You're pro at it. Yes Paul, I couldn't agree with you more. This is more what I was looking for from Duca. He's been playing it too safe to show a good impression. No, stop that and just be you. So, we finally got there in the end of what she was talking about. Finally. So she continues to say that you guys want me here to be genuine with someone that's only here for fame. That's how she said it. I actually believe her in what she said, in what he said. But at the same time, she's the one that goads him, as far as I'm concerned. If your attitude didn't stink, his approach would be so different. Yes, Duca, speak up. Do you really want to be here? No, I'm closed off to it now. You're closed off to it now? You were closed off from the beginning, from the word go. This guy didn't stand a chance. From the time you walked up the aisle, you were not into him. You were not interested. You had the attitude, the face, the, the rolling of the eyes, all of it. Your attitude stank from the beginning. And it carried on through this whole process. And now you expect him to change. He doesn't know who you are. Let alone you know who he is. You never gave him a chance. I'm just opening, exposing myself up to her. I don't want to do it. I've had enough. I've had enough shit. I don't want it anymore. It's not. Just let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. We saw the tears. And to be honest, I actually felt sorry for her. Because she's hurting. But the bit I don't understand is, you applied for the show. 
You knew what it entailed. Marrying a stranger. So with that, you have to think about bringing your guard down, opening up and doing all the work it entails for a marriage. But instead you come in there with a whole heap of brokenness. Expecting what? For him to help you heal? This doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. I've got nothing more to say here. Nothing more to say. Everything was left up in the air. They had 24 hours to think, well, Whitney had 24 hours to think about whether she wanted to stay in the experiment or not. So that's how that ended there. In the meantime, what happened with Adrian and Thomas? They got into an argument because of the situation with Thomas arguing with Whitney. Ugh. It's the same shit. Same shit, different day. I'm talked out. I'm talked out. So this is where I'm going to leave it. If you like what you heard, please like, comment and subscribe. Till next time.